Hello everyone. In this video lecture, we are going to cover PowerPoint lecture 12 and which basically covers material from chapter 7. Now chapter 7 is again very detailed so we have to break down the chapter 7 into two parts. So lecture 12 will contain the first part of chapter 7 and lecture 13 when we will cover uh, which we will cover in a different video uh, will con will contain material for the latter part of chapter 7. So chapter 7 mainly talks about classical theory and new classical theories, okay? And it starts off with classical theory. So in order to understand classical theory, we first have to understand that this theory was introduced by the father of economics, Adam Smith. He emphasized that an economy operates under two principles, okay? So there are two principles when an economy is operating. One is invisible hands and the other is laissez-faire economics. We did touch these topics a little bit in the beginning of the semester uh, when we were talking about competition and all that. But basically, when he, these are his two principles and he says that when we have these two principles, an economy will be at equilibrium at, and at stability and, uh, you know, there won't be um, and it will be efficient. It will be fully efficient also. Okay. So what does invisible hand means? The invisible hand principle argues that competition is very important in an economy. Competition between the businesses and the producers will move an economy to efficiency and higher standard of living. And, you know, competition between the producers in order to sell the goods and services to the consumers at the market price will create efficiency in the market. So that's the first principle. And the second principle is called losses fair economics. And the, this, this is an idea that basically states that an economy uh, should have limited government. You know, government should not interfere in the market, but they should be there to facilitate the market. Their role should be very limited to help bring about a market, but not to go and set market prices or to put up regulations to stop market transactions. So those were the two theories on which Adam Smith um, based his concepts. Now, Smith's theory was modified in 1803 by another economist called Jean Baptiste Say. And he said that it is in order to have an efficient economy and in order to have economic growth um, or to have a stable economy, it is necessary to have abundance of other products and not the abundance of money. And with that, in fact, will generate or facilitate sales. So abundance of other products and not abundance of money in general will facilitate sales. OK, and the main thing that he said, and which is also one of the main criteria under classical theory, is that supply creates its own demand. So in this, in this, um, in this whiteboard, I will basically write the criteria of classical economics. Okay, so classical economics or classical theory, and based on what we have so far seen, the first criteria is, or the first principle for classical theory is that supply creates its own demand. That's the one first thing. So what does this mean? What does supply creates its own demand means? Basically, what the economist supporting classical theory is saying is if production of goods and services are created, then there will be sufficient flow of funds or money to purchase everything else. Okay. Remember the circular flow of income that we discussed in chapter one. Let's try to remember that, you know, if businesses increase their production of goods and services, what are they going to do? They are going to buy the good uh, the resources or the factors of production from the households. OK, and in return, they are going to pay them income in the form of rent, salary, wages, interest, and the households can have use these income to buy goods and services in the market. So that's what it's saying. If production goes up, it will create more income from the households. And as a result, as their income went up, they, were, they will increase their consumption, which eventually will cause the economy to grow. Okay. 
again when people have more money they will spend it on other goods and amount of income generated will be equal to the amount of spending okay so this theory stated that if people have money it is irrational to stock so another thing that we assume is that it is um, under this theory we assume that when people get in income it is irrational to stock so people will spend the income and they will not save it as they think it is irrational to save or stock so people will spend income okay that's another theory under classical that's another um, basic basic principle under the classical theory now this theory also says that recession is unlikely since people receive money to produce and the funds they receive will be spent to buy other goods and services so classical theory says free market will ensure price stability and full employment so in a free market so the under the classical theory we are saying that the free market will always be stable and it will have a stable price it will be in equilibrium in the long run um, because you know people do not save money and then there is circular flow of income and we're going to see other reasons why the economy will be always stable so the assumption is that free market economy will operate at full employment in the long run so under this classical theory we will assume that the economy will be at full employment meaning all the resources are used to their full capacity whatever resources we have we are using them all there is no underemployment or unemployment of resources and basically the economy is at full employment okay so and at that top point the economy is always stable um, and we can have some short-term adjustments or short-term recessions but in the long run the economy will always be stable and efficient these economies did believe one thing events such as war disease or natural disaster can cause extended disruptions you know if in normal situations we will not see recessions under classical theory um you know only maybe there may be some shocks for a short period of time or some adjustments for a short period of time however this theory does state that events such as war disease or natural disaster can cause extended disruptions which can cause recessions you know such as a uh, most recent example would be the coronavirus pandemic which is a kind of disease that is affecting the economy right economy is shutting down people are not going to restaurants hotels movie theaters so everything is, is all the businesses are going downhill right during coronavirus okay so that's an example the classical theory is saying that in, in in normal circumstances economy will always be at equilibrium at stable prices there may be short-term uh, shocks or adjustments but events such as war disease and natural disaster can ca cause long-term or extended disruptions okay now this theory was used to explain the u.s economy from the 1800s till the 1930s until the great depression hit so this was a theory that we could have used to explain how the economy is working in the u.s until the 1930s when the great depression hit this theory failed and we were not able to use this theory anymore but before the 1930s starting from 1800s this theory was very successful in explaining how the u.s economy was operating okay so this theory stated that recession occurred due to lack of supply and not lack of demand by consumers again the classical theory states that supply creates um, demand so recession is created because of a lack of supply which eventually causes a lack of demand okay and business activities can be increased by stimulating supply a lack of supply for goods creates a lack of business activity resulting in less income coming to households and therefore decrease in consumption okay now when we look at classical theory there are three assumptions that we make okay um, when we are analyzing an economy using classical theory we we make three assumptions or there are three assumptions that we have to take into account the first one is there is no government influence 
again remember adam smith said a laissez fair economics principle under a free market society which means there is very limited government or literally no government there at all so basically one of the first assumptions of classical theory is there is no government influence the second assumption is there is no international trade so only domestic production we focus on the domestic production we do not focus on exports and imports and finally another assumptions we make is that businesses do not hold savings remember we were saying people will always spend the money and at the same time businesses will also not hold savings they will spend all the money so these are the three assumptions no government no international trades and businesses will not hold savings if you compare it based on these assumptions if you compare it to today's reality there are significant limitations today right the government is heavily involved in today's economy international trade is very much involved you know there's globalization going on and businesses probably keep savings as well so this classical theory can be explained through a bathtub model okay one of the models we can use to explain the classical theory is the bathtub model the bottom model basically it is a it, it is a diagram that helps us to visualize the cause and effect relationships within a classical economy okay and i wanted to draw the uh, diagram and explain you the different um, the different <coughs> items of the diagram and you have to know this diagram you have to know what each of these uh, items mean in the diagram so you can understand what is happening in the economy so classical theory bathtub model and we call it bathtub because we use a bathtub to explain the um, operations of the classical theory in an economy okay and how the economy operates under the classical theory so let's say this is the bathtub and excuse me because i'm not very good in drawing but i will try my best so let's say this is the bathtub. Now there is a faucet and water is coming into the tub. Okay. And this faucet is connected back to the tub through a pipe. And then there is a level of water here. And there will be some water leaking through this pipe and it will go back into the top through the faucet okay now i want to explain you now i want to label this diagram and you also have to know how to label this diagram and understand what's going on in the economy under the classical theory model okay so this level of water or this water represents employment income and output so the level of water represents the output in the economy the employment and the income okay now the water the water that is coming out of the faucet into the bathtub are injections and what are the injections into the economy what creates gdp what are the factors that creates gdp that is consumption from consumer side plus investment now remember we are saying there is no government so we will not add government now in reality government do ex spend money and that goes towards the output but under classical theory one of the assumptions we make is there is no government so we will not include government under injections another injection we uh, we can uh, we can we exclude under classical theory is exports right in reality um, U.S. is exporting goods and services to other countries, but we do not include that because the classical theory assumption is there is no international trade and we also take out imports out of this equation. So we do not include government imports and exports because those are under the assumptions that we that, that when the economy is operating, these are not there. OK, so now we know the level of water. We know what is the water that is coming up, which is consumption from the consumers and investment from the business side now this pipe represents banks or credit unions and this leakage represents savings okay 
So this is very interesting. See how it is working. Okay, it is very interesting to explain how this works. So this is the level of output. Okay, the water level is the level of output in the economy. Because of consumption and investment by business, we are getting the output. Okay, now we are saying that in under classical theory, the economy is always at equilibrium and we are at full employment in the long run. Therefore, this output will be fixed in the long run and the level of water will not change in the long run. Now, it can change in the short run but not in the long run so in the long run the level of water will remain the same for the bathtub model under the classical theory because we are always at equilibrium and prices are stable and we are producing at the maximum output possible okay now look at this the income from some from our income we usually save some money and that money is going out of this Tab, right because we are not using that income to do to consume goods and services we are taking it out from the economy and as we are taking it out we are probably putting it in the banks in our savings accounts right so the savings is going into the banks let's say that's where the savings are and then what do the banks do the banks usually use these savings funds to give loans to businesses and then businesses make investments using the loans or the savings funds from the banks. And that investment comes back into the economy through the injection. Okay, so this is very interesting again. Consumption and investments are injections in the economy which determine the level of water. The level of water will remain fixed um, in the long run. In the short run, it can go up and down, but in the long run, it will be always fixed. We can have a little bit of leakage from the bathtub and that leakage represents savings. Basically, we are taking out some of our income and putting it into the banks, which are the pipe. And then the bank uses those funds to give loans to businesses so that they can make investments in the economy, which go back as, um, <coughs> you know, um, as output into the economy again. Now, in this case, under classical theory, we will assume that savings is equal to investments. We will assume that all, all the savings that people are putting in the bank will be used up as investment funds. There won't be any differences between savings and investments. So this is very important. Make sure you understand this diagram. Again, remember the water can go up and down in the short run because of short run disruptions. But in the long run, economy is always at full equilibrium and the level of water will remain the same. Okay, so according to the classical theory economics, the level of water in the tap is at the maximum because national quantity supplied is equal to national quantity demanded. This is where aggregate demand is equal to aggregate supply. Therefore, the level of water is maximum and we are at equilibrium. And it remains constant because the amount of injection of investment is equal to the leakage of savings. Again, that's what I said, right? Savings is equal to investments and that's why the level of water do not change. Now, if savings is less than, um, if savings is less than investments, then level of water will go up because we will have more injections and less leakages. If savings is greater than investments, the level of water will go down because we have more leakages and less injections. Just look at the diagram and um, think, it, think of it in terms of injections and leakages. So savings is, so uh, before I go into this, I want to explain that the classical theory, when they say is uh, basically when they are saying, When classical theory says that the economy will come back to full equilibrium, they are saying that they will come back to full equilibrium using two mechanisms. So under classical theory, economy will always be in equilibrium in the long run 
Now this is under classical theory. Now under other theories it can be different, which we will see in later classes. But under classical theory, economy will always be in equilibrium in the long run because of two mechanisms. Basically, even if there are short run short term adjustments or short term disruptions these two mechanisms will work automatically and bring the economy back to equilibrium in the long run so again remember classical theory said in the short run we can have some um, disruptions but in the long run we will be back to the equilibrium and basically the two mechanisms that i'm going to talk about now will bring the economy back to uh, um, equilibrium and these are basically automatic adjustments that take place in the market okay so the first one is called flexible interest rate flexible interest rate causes the market to come back to equilibrium in the long run and second one is flexible prices and wages okay and i'm going to go over these two concepts or these two mechanisms so you clearly understand how these two mechanisms will bring the economy back to equilibrium okay so first one is flexible interest rate so under this mechanism savings is linked to investment through flexible interest rate okay although savings is a leakage this money is borrowed by businesses and spent as investment for capital goods again we put the money in the savings account of banks and businesses take loans from the banks using the savings funds and make business investments or capital investments um, and we assume that all of the money that we keep in the bank account is going to be loaned out as investments to businesses now if businesses let's say if businesses they want more funds they see there is demand in the market and they want to increase their production and they more want more funds what will happen is the interest rate will go up the interest rate on the loans will go up and at the same time the interest rate on savings accounts will go up so if the interest rate on savings go up what's going to happen people are going to save more money right so that's what is going to happen so in classical theory interest rates are flexible and adjust as a result all income will be spent either through consumption by individuals or investment by his businesses okay so interest rates are flexible whenever there is an increase in demand from the businesses interest rates will go up so businesses will then loan less and at the same time savings will go up because people will now get more return from savings accounts on the other hand if businesses do not want to or if businesses are discouraged to make investments and they are not taking enough loans banks will lower their interest rates because they are flexible and then this will give motivation for the businesses to take loans from the banks and then you know savings will also go down because interest rates have gone down so the interest rate will adjust automatically based on what the businesses want if they want to make more investment and want more fun interest rate will go up if they want less investment and they don't want to borrow money then interest rates will go down to this encourage them to get more money and that's how savings and investments will always be equal to one another now another mechanism is called the flexible wages and prices so under this mechanism you know what it means is in the short run people can decrease their spending or consumption you know because of many factors you know maybe their income fell or maybe because there was a migration of people leaving the country or leaving the economy so there was a decrease in their spending and if this occurs under the classical theory and under the flexible wages and prices mechanism if this happens then what will happen to the inventories in the market people are not going not enough people are going to the market to buy goods and services and as a result the inventory of goods and services will go up and therefore um, they will the businesses will reduce their prices so they are the, the, the prices are flexible when they will see there is less demand for their product they will reduce their prices so that's flexible prices and in turn if they are reducing their prices that means they are cutting their profitability and one way to cover up for their profitability is they will reduce the wages okay so we are assuming that laborers will be okay with lowering the wages during times of recession or during uh, periods of um, you know low spending you know because prices have gone down and businesses can 
lower the prices because it's flexible and the way they cover up the lower prices or the way they cover up their cost is by lowering the wages of the workers because we are assuming that the wages are flexible and they are not sticky okay and this price wage flexibility restores the economy back to full employment because when they reduce the price you know and when they reduce the wages their cost of production goes down so they can lower the price and when price goes down people will say oh the price of goods have gone down so they will start increasing their consumption and economy will come back to equilibrium that's how the two mechanisms work to bring the economy back to equilibrium okay and the classical theory assumes that economy can adjust itself without intervention from government so again if you look at the flexible interest rate mechanism and flexible wages and prices there has been no government intervention at all the market is automatically responding to the changes in scenario and they are adjusting there is no need for the government to come in so that's what's happening under the classical theory okay now the classical theory can also be explained through another model which is called the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model okay it's basically demand and supply curve but we are thinking now in terms of the economy um, now aggregate demand is basically the national quantity of goods and services purchased at various national prices same definition as demand but it is just for the economy now it includes purchases by consumers and investments and there is a negative or inverse relationship between aggregate demand and the price of goods and services just like so that means it's downward sloping just like a downward demand curve that is downward sloping an aggregate demand curve is always downward sloping because price and quantity demanded are negatively related on the other hand we have aggregate supply aggregate supply is the national quantity of goods and services that, that are brought to the market by producers or businesses at various prices and there is a positive relationship between price and quantity supply and um, that that means the aggregate supply curve is upward sloping which is pretty much the same as normal supply curve so basically this is how a supply and demand curve will look like or aggregate demand and supply curve will look like the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping and again on the x-axis we have quantity on the y-axis we have price and the aggregate supply curve is in the is an upward sloping curve and the point where they intersect where the two curves intersect is the equilibrium and this is where the economy will be in the long run because it will be always stable and prices will be stable it will be at equilibrium um, and therefore this is where the economy will be in the long run and that's how we can use aggregate demand and aggregate supply curve to show the economy in the long run under the classical theory okay another thing in this case the prices which are national prices also represents inflation right because it is the overall change in price if there is a change in price from here to here let's say the prices go up from here to here that is a change in price of overall that is an overall change in price of all goods and services or a basket of goods and services in the economy so that represents inflation in the economy because now we are talking in aggregate terms so we have instead of demand we have aggregate demand instead of supply we have aggregate supply and the price on the y-axis represents inflation So under classical theory, aggregate demand only constitutes consumption and investments. Again, remember, it does not include government. It does not include international trade because those are the assumptions of classical theory. And only consumption and investments are included for aggregate demand. Okay. And aggregate supply is basically the quantity of products brought to the market. And it can be defined as the NDP, the net domestic product. So it is the value of goods and services that is actually brought to the market. Now again, we want to know why the why the demand curve or the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping and why there is a negative relationship between quantity and national output. So there are three main reasons why um, the slope is negative. The first one is if prices are higher, people will have less purchasing power. You know, if price is high, that means you can afford less, so you have less purchasing power, and therefore you purchase less quantity. 
The second reason is if prices are higher, your nominal interest rate will also be higher. Therefore, the cost of goods sold will be higher, right? Because the cost of production is higher because now loans are more expensive. The nominal interest rate is high because of inflation, right? Because prices are higher, which means inflation, the nominal interest rate will be higher because nominal interest rate is equals to real interest rate plus inflation. So since inflation is high, nominal interest rate will be higher, which means the cost of goods sold will be higher or cost of production will be higher for the businesses because they will have to pay more interest now and which in turn will result in increase in prices and lower aggregate quantity demanded. Finally, when prices are higher in a nation, fewer products will be purchased for exports by international markets. So exports will be going down and therefore aggregate quantity demand or AD will be fewer or less. Another important criteria of classical theory is the economy is at full employment in the long run. Therefore, the aggregate supply curve is vertical in the long run. Now in the Short run, the aggregate supply curve is upward sloping, but since the economy is at full capacity in the, in the uh, long run, and this will not change. That's the maximum that can be produced in the economy. It will not change. It cannot increase any further. Therefore, the vertical, uh, therefore, the aggregate supply curve is vertical. So this is another criteria for classical theory, which I want to write here is that economy. will be at full employment long run and therefore the aggregate supply curve in long run will be vertical and this will not change this cannot change the position will not change it will not shift it will not move in the long run because we are at full employment we are using all the resources completely it's not possible to increase the output more than that that's one that's what we are believing under the classical theory okay so remember this economy will be always at full employment in the long run and we know why it's going to be because of the two mechanisms of flexible interest rate and flexible wages and prices and as a result the aggregate supply curve in the long run will always be vertical and this cannot change in the long run. So what does that mean? The aggregate supply curve will look like this and demand curve will look like this. Aggregate demand curve will look like this. Okay, so in the long run, we will have an aggregate supply curve that is vertical. So if aggregate demand increases in the long run, it will only create inflation because output is not increasing, but price will go up. So it will only create inflation. So classical theory was working very well to explain what was going on in the economy until the 1930s when the Great Depression hit the economy. It is one of the worst situations or one of the worst economic conditions that our country has experienced and that's when the classical theory failed to explain what was going on in the economy the concepts the mechanisms they were trying to use to explain how the economy operates operates were not working they were failing okay the u.s stock market fa fell the stock market crashed which in turn caused decrease in business investment as the stock market fells businesses were uh, getting less investments or less sources of funds and as a result they had to cut down their investment we and one way they can cut down their investment is they lay off people and therefore that cause unemployment as people were losing their jobs the income coming to them were also going down and that caused the consumption to go down further uh, similarly government had less revenue from taxes and government spending was also reduced which decreased the aggregate demand so this further magnified the fall in the economy. Additionally, foreign sectors exports, um, you know, such as exports were reduced and foreign consumers had less income to spend. So every sector of the economy was affected during the Great Depression and classical economy was not a successful in explaining what was going on. OK, and, you know, again, we assume that under the classical theory, the economy will 
um, uh, make adjustments through flexible wages, flexible prices, and flexible interest rate until aggregate demand is equal to un aggregate supply. But during the Great Depression, these mechanisms were not working. They just did not re restore the economy back to equilibrium. Something was wrong, and it was not going through. Uh, it was not happening. Okay. You know, remember classical theory state that supply would create sufficient demand for employment and um, that will ultimately cause automatic clearing of products um, and that was not happening. You know, aggregate supply was significantly higher in under the Great Depression than aggregate demand causes the businesses to make more cuts in employment and outputs as inventories further increase. You know, and within the bathtub theory, savings was not equal to investments. So none of the theories that the classical theories um, principles stated were working during the Great Depression. Okay, businesses did not make new investments. Savings was greater than investments. Um, you know, even though um, banks cut down interest rate, that still did not provide incentive for the businesses to take loans. You know, even though they cut down, even though the biz the banks cut down interest rate, businesses were still not taking loans to make investments. So there was something wrong. Similarly, in the market, businesses were cutting down the wages and cutting down the prices to increase consumption, but consumption was not going up um, as much as it was needed or in order to bring the economy back to equilibrium. So it was a very perplex situation, very bad situation, and the government was in a very uh, awkward situation because we nobody knew what was going on and we had to come up with a solution and that's why it was called it's called the Great Depression. Ultimately, you know, the Great Depression was solved when we switched from a classical theory model to a Keynesian theory model, and that's what we're going to look in chapter eight. Um, you know, the Great we took the economy out of the Great Depression using the Keynesian theory model, and uh, because classical theory was failing, but again. Keynesian theory we only use from 1930s to 1960s. After that, Keynesian theory was also failing. And then we came up with another theory, which is called the neoclassical theory or new classical theory, which was based on the class original classical theory, but they were modified and altered in order to address some of the problems. Um, that classical theory failed to, to explain. Okay, so from 1800s to 1930s, we had the classical theory to explain the economy. From 1930s to 1960s or early 1970s, we had the Keynesian theory, and then from 1970s until today, we use the new classical theory policies to explain what's going on in the economy. In our next lecture, in in the lecture 13, we are going to talk about new classical theory. That's also part of chapter seven because it is just an extension of classical theory with newer and modified principles to help explain what's going on in the economy. Um, on the other hand, in chapter eight, we are going to talk about Keynesian theory, uh, which talks, uh, which will basically describe how we recovered ourselves from the economy during the Great Depression. So, but for now, I will stop here, you know, um, uh, and that's the end of lecture 12. I will continue next class with lecture 13. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, um, you guys stay safe and thank you very much.